So maybe we can focus on some uh, equipment now at this point. So I've got actually got um, aviation top of my list here. So I, I think there's some reason for that in the in any discussion of ground warfare. It's actually very easy to overlook aviation. So um, and that's that's mostly helicopters the, these days. Um, and then we should talk about UAVs. But maybe we could focus on. Let's, let's just go to helicopters first of all, because um, I've already had a discussion about how the Marine Corps, separate discussion, not with you two, but a separate discussion on how the Marine Corps is is divesting a lot of its helicopters. Um, so maybe we could we could talk about the future of helicopters in support of ground operations. Uh, and I think um, Rafi, uh, you, you, you've written you've written some great stuff on this. So maybe we could start with you. Yeah, I mean, so look, I think it's important to really wrap in uh, a discussion of helicopters in general into ground warfare. I mean, not only if you look at the current chief of staffs of the Army uh, background, he's an aviator by trade. He's the first helicopter pilot who's now the chief. I mean, which should tell you something. You also, if you look at the Army budget, one of the largest slices for modernization is going to future vertical lift, which is the next helicopter, or was it a helicopter, was it looks something more like an Osprey, so type aircraft. So it, the Army is investing heavily in it. And then there's a question of whether or not this thing can actually survive in general, and particularly as air defense has become more prol prolific and frankly better. Um, so, I mean, one of all sort of ongoing questions is, you know, can this thing survive in a Russia-China scenario? It's, mm, probably not. Um, at least that's what all it shows. If you talk to the aviation, the Army aviation folks, they'll tell you a reason why they think it can. I mean, it goes back to some of my earlier remarks where, you know, this is where the different types of conflicts that the Army needs to optimize for sort of cut in different directions. Because we know that aviation was actually quite useful for counterterrorism, for some of these sort of low end gray zone stuff where you need to move around the battlefield really quickly. You know, you want to be able to deploy forces. You don't necessarily want to rely on a missile uh, to do it. But once we move into the higher end of the spectrum, these, things, these platforms are not particularly well protected and they can't be well protected by design. And that's, I think, where the Army finds itself sort of torn and running to cross purposes. Yeah, I, I would second that. And I think that's where we are right now is that um, I don't see the Marine Corps as giving up on amphibious operations. I see them kind of being leery and in moving into current platform design now, given the vulnerability. I think that's the key challenge is that anything we build as a dramatic escalation of costs is going to be quite vulnerable in the future operating environment. And the question is, how do we deliver troops? How do we deliver manpower um, into the future? And I'm not really sure we have an answer to that because um, you know, in the reality of, of combat and the reality of fire is going to change a lot of people's minds. And um, I'm not sure where we should be invested, especially in terms of rotary technology. I think drones is a, more interesting uh, grounds for moving forward in the future. Yeah, so let's let's switch to, to UAVs, drones, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs. Uh, so what's the future of UAVs? Uh, maybe let's just go to Rafi, first of all. Sure. Yeah, so I think there's, I mean, this is also where, you know, the conflict pull in different directions, because when you saw the Predator or the Reaper drones, which was sort of the staple of a counterterrorism fight, all of those would die in a high-end fight fairly dramatically. Uh, I mean, they're slow, they're not particularly salesy and the like. Uh, so if you talk about sort of what kind of drones you want, what kind of unmanned uh, aerial vehicles you want for a high-end fight, they've talked about may having many more of them, having sort of this swarm concept that you can all sort of link together, uh, you know, AI and so on. There's talk about trying to do some un uh, manned and unmanned teaming, so basically you have some manned, some unmanned platforms, and they you try to leverage both to get the sort of optimization feature. There's a lot of interesting experimentation happening. Um, was or not, how much of this is actually practical, and how much of it will be uh, cost effective? I think it ultimately remains to be seen, and that I think was where the joy is out. But the concept I think makes sense in the abstract. Was or not it's practical? I think that's a open question. Yeah, and I'd add that we're doing a lot of work on swarms. We're trying to figure out the logic and the technology of swarms. I think there's a lot to be said about 
uh, drones and swarming technology. But the limitation, of course, is you need AI for this. And the problem is, is that we don't have people who are collecting data. We don't have people who are analyzing data. We don't have people to put data models into operation for the drones and the swarms to utilize them. So um, there's a disconnect there. But I, I think swarms are probably part of the future. Um, one of the key things we're looking at is loitering drone, uh, drones. Drone, <laughs> drones uh, thinking more about heavily armed platforms that can loiter over a problem area for a long time that are cheap. That is really useful to us. And then finally, I think we don't talk enough about um, logistics connecting that to unmanned vehicles and how resupply can be done through drones. And I think that's a big failing. And that's something we need to really kind of uh, buff our resources on moving into the future because if we're going to operate in a, you know, in a, in a EABO kind of a standpoint, we need to think about how we're going to resupply. And if we don't have helicopters, how are we going to do that? And I think there's a lot of opportunity for drones and unmanned to, be, to play a role in that part. Right, so we've talked about two categories of UAVs uh, so far, and I think there's a third one. So, so we talked about, but Brandon's talked about large platforms that can loiter with significant weapons on them, uh, and then by implication, the sort of drones that can swarm, they're small and they're autonomous, so they're, and, and they're communicating with each other so they can swarm in, 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 in intelligent ways. I think there's a third one, which is uh, the question of whether we distribute more small drones to the ground forces to the lower echelons um, so there's been a debate about whether you have big platforms that are that are managed at higher echelons or whether you have more more distribution of smaller platforms with very short range uh, intelligence uh, uh, and surveillance and reconnaissance capabilities you know sort of UAVs that could could in a in a block by block counterinsurgency war could could see over the to the next street say so is there um is there a de debate that I'm that I'm missing is that has that debate dropped out are we no longer debating that that sort of uh, tension or um or, or or is there room for uh for a discussion about whether um we should be more distributed or more centralized in our UAV distribution? In some ways, the debate seems to be just more and more drones. Yeah. <laughs> just give us more and legacy systems. And, you know, to me, it's a trade off in some ways that, you know, there are some, there are some things that exquisite technologies are useful for, and there are some things that drones are useful for, and sometimes the, never, the two shall never meet. Uh, but I don't know. I, I don't think we're having solid debates on the trade-offs really right now? I don't know, Rafi? Yeah, I mean, I, I would echo some of that. I think there's a debate about, uh, less about distribution and more about um, cost of the individual drones, whether or not you should get invest in these sort of high exquisite platform, or whether or not you want to really get into fairly cheap drones, the one that get shot down because all these drone is really difficult um, and one that's going to survive uh, being Russian or Chinese air defenses is damn near impossible as as far as I've seen. So, you know, not when it, it's the question is when it gets shot down, not what it will eventually. So yeah. the, the July, June crisis with Iran is pretty indicative of this kind of future discourse because, you know, they, of course, shot down a global hawk. They, of course, launched cruise missiles at us. And we kind of just dismissed it as, you know, not expensive, these are cheap, they didn't hit anyone, only 100 people got a concussion. And we kind of just played it off and we de-escalated, which was good at the time, because I certainly don't want to go to war with Iran. But then on the other hand, I worry about American credibility. And I worry about how these new technologies, especially cheaper drones, are going to fit into course of uh, bargaining platforms moving into the future. Yeah, yeah well said. Well, thank you both. So, so let's switch to another major platform, tanks. So what is the future of tanks? <laughs> Rafi? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I think the future of tanks, I mean, this again gets, I'll go back to the part of being torn in different directions. I think there's not much of a future for tanks in the Pacific. Uh, I haven't seen a good concept that will tell me how you're going to use a heavy brigade combat team in these places you would want to operate in. There is something to be said for tanks for deterrence. 
uh, particularly in Europe. Uh, you know, we have some gaming that sort of gets to that. Um, you know, but the big question is, and this goes back to Brandon's original point, is like, can you get the tank there in time? I mean, tanks, if you, if you have tanks in the United States, in most plausible conflicts that we play out, they don't get to wherever you need to go in time for the crisis. Um, you know, there's just the distance uh, doesn't work. So tanks could be useful. It could be useful if uh, they are forward positioned. And oh, by the way, they are useful if they are protected, which our current tanks are not, because we, have, we haven't made some of those necessary investments uh, in terms of active protection and the like. Yeah, I was that. I'll turn it over to Brandon. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting being, in, you know, working with the Marine Corps because we don't talk about tanks anymore. You know, and if they're going to mythologize any sort of technology from the past, it's artillery. So, you know, there's different cultures in the military and it's not clearly unified. And, um, you know, we just don't talk about tanks anymore. I think, you know, for the Marine Corps, I think a lot of their history is really based on amphibious uh, Higgins type platforms. And uh, that really comes down to like a, um, a reliance on innovation in some ways, but I think it's also a reliance on independence and a reliance on flexibility. I think that's important for some branches. So I, I think that's one of the reasons the Marine Corps might have moved away from tanks. It's probably more of a culture thing in some ways. I don't know. It's just I'm speculating. I'm spitballing this in ways. Right. Well, so the next arm we need to look at is artillery. So that's a good way, a good segue. Thank you, Brandon. So we've already alluded to uh, big changes in artillery. So it's certainly precision fires and long range uh, missiles. Um, so. Let's clarify these. Well, Rafi, maybe we can start with you because this is how we're, we're bouncing back and forth. So what's the future of artillery? So I think there's a question of range, there's a question of mass too. Um, and I think there's a general belief, at least in army circles, that you need many more fires, not just longer range. And the longer range one, I mean, this gets into the question of, in some ways on intelligence, like how well do you know where your adversary is going to be in the future? And if you're dealing with people who are reasonably sophisticated, they're not going to just sit out in the open letting, waiting for you to hit them. Uh, if you have long range precision fires, that's great, um, but that only works if you know exactly where it is. Otherwise, you need to rely on mass to sort of blanket the area. Uh, so I think there's that tension here too. There's also the question of when we talk about fires, are we also, we're also talking about air defenses as well, which is the other sort of real gap here. The army in particular divested itself of, um, in fairly dramatic fashion during the uh, counterinsurgencies of Iraq and Afghanistan. And realizing that, you know, if you're going to be fighting adversaries, you need air defenses. Um, and you need to be able to protect yourself against ballistic missiles. You need to protect yourself against cruise missiles. The adversary is you may need to protect yourself against uh, fixed wing aviation as well. And wing aviation as well. And so you're seeing a rebirth of the air defense artillery branch um, as a necessary arm of ground forces. Yeah, I, I would second that. I, I think air defenses are critical moving in the future. Sensors kind of trying to team that with multi-domain battle systems. I think that's going to be important moving into the future. Uh, yeah, and I get a lot of the same sense too. Um, you know, I have some Marines that are kind of, well, why don't we have battleships anymore? Why can't we have battleships? Why can't we mass fire? Um, and that's an interesting question. And that leads to things like container ships and other sorts of new innovative ideas. Um, so we haven't really given up on these kind of age hold ideas of uh, delivering a massive amount of fire, you know, from a short range. Uh, but it's really a question of how we would do that in the future, given the, you know, the expense of losing the troop, the, the massive, you know, uh, the, the, the massive infrastructure needed to support casualties and the the knock on social problems. So, you know, these are things we need to consider and uh, how are we gonna deliver fires? It's, it's really been moved towards a long range idea. And I think that's a question for some people is, are we depending too much on long range fires? And then what if we're blinded to our sensors? What if we're blinded to our spotting mechanisms? Um, I, I think that's a real fear. So um, I really don't know what the future of artillery is given this sort of this, this debate between a new innovative idea of a new, you know, a, a new battlefield or a high Mars, or this a new innovative idea, a long range fire, loitering, um, you know, cruise missiles spotted by drones. 
You know, these, these are clear tensions. And then the third issue would be money. Um, when we talk about these things in the military, we don't talk about costs. And um, the reality is we've been spending way too much and we can't support it. And it's going to get even worse given, uh, you know, the, the problems of COVID and whatever sort of depression we're entering into, despite what the stock market says. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> so next on my list is infantry. And this is a difficult one because we're sort of talking about equipment and major platforms. And it's easy to neglect the infantry as an arm. Um, it's a difficult question because infantry, you know, there's there's uh, all sorts of issues of equipment and um you know whether it should be dismounted or mounted and how you do that and how they integrate with other arms and so forth so uh, it's a complicated one but it, it, and that's part of the motivation i think for a lot of people to, to to just ignore the infantry when they think about the future but but we should address it so what's the future of infantry and and i realize um for brandon it, we, we, we want to look at look at marine rifles right uh, as 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 the equivalent um but brandon uh, i'm sorry rafi let's start with you please yeah so i mean i'll give you my i mean this is the punch not necessarily a scientific finding um is that my guess is these the number of infantry brigades are going to go down and go down for a variety of reasons first some of it is technological driven if you know as you have more and more advanced systems, there's going to be an impetus to invest more, put more into these types of that one to not put humans in harm's way. Um, that's politically easier. Um, some of it is going to be driven as what Brandon was talking about is by cost. Um, the cost of your average DOD soldier has been going up dramatically. Um, that's based on retirement. That's partly based on the fact that we keep giving DOD pay raises, uh, even during um, and all that means that as the cost of being the individual soldier gets more expensive, there's an incentive there to sort of move in a different direction. So if, you know, the only countervailing force here is that the army really still revolves culturally around the infantry. Uh, as an important branch, is we're one that produces a disproportionate number of the army leadership. Um, so it's going to, that would be, it's a, it's a, it's a pain, culturally painful thing to give up on infantry men. But I think ultimately, both for technological reasons and for budgetary reasons, I think yeah, that's going to end up happening. Yeah, I'm seeing the same trends. Um, you know, we need to have a real conversation on, you know, manpower and our reliance on it too much. And, you know, there's a lot of jokes in the Marine Corps about you know, why pay for a machine to do something when you can get 30 troops to do it for you? You know, that, that sort of stuff. It's, that sort of stuff has to go away. And then there's a deeper societal conversation about infantry and the value of a soldier and, you know, suicide rates and, you know, even Black Lives Matter, too, you know, where there's a, a certain tendency to put certain types of troops in certain types of jobs. And um, this has been a legacy in the military that it's something that we need to change and we need to, to fix because um, the military should be a leader in society, not a follower. So I'm curious how these things are going to enter into the conversation moving into the future, um, especially with a possible new administration that might be a little bit more concerned about the social well-being of our troops. I mean, um, we have a big problem. We, we can't educate our soldiers. We can't. We, we have a problem at the PME level, and we have a problem at just basically keeping our soldiers happy in terms of uh, basing and getting their, their children educated. So, um, you know, a large military makes these things very, very tough to do. I don't know how we're going to move forward in the future. All right, thank you. So uh, we should look at cyber now. So cyber is a tricky one. It's sort of equipment, but there's all sorts of um, uh, difficulties in forecasting cyber. It's a fairly recent uh, sector of the military capability spectrum. Um, and as Brandon has, has alluded to, there's, uh, there's difficulties in modeling the, the future of cyber warfare. So I realize this is a difficult thing for you both to, to make forecasts on, but we should address it. So what's the future of cyber in ground warfare? Rafi? I mean, I think a lot of what I have to say on the subject has already been said. Um, I'll say that any war game I've actually sat in never has a particularly good job of modeling it. I usually 
devolves into, well, I did a cyber attack on you and you did a cyber attack on me and, you know, the two sides will stand up, they'll, uh, uh, you know, head to head and don't really get anywhere. And I think some of that is based on lack of understanding. Some of that's also based on the fact that a lot of things tend to be classified up to Wazoo. Uh, so, you know, even if you're running, so any classified war game is not going to really to have an a open conversation about what cyber can and cannot do in, you know, War on the Box or any of the other sort of professional military circles uh, public that allow you to sort of get at some of these harder questions. I think there's a general consensus that cyber is going to be more important in ground warfare, but beyond that sort of top line, you know, what that actually looks like and what it actually can and cannot accomplish, I think that it gets really fuzzy really quick. Yeah, I don't know where to begin on this. Um, I, I think you're really right, Rafi. Um, we're not sure what it can and can't do. We have a very poor method of evaluating the effectiveness of cyber operations, and it's part of what the Slayer Commission did. And I purposely wrote something that probably is going to end up in the NDA, where we're making the cyber posture review actually look at the effectiveness of operations. And when you look at the effectiveness of cyber operations at the tactical or battlefield level, you find very disappointing results. Um, I think it was Bob Work wrote a nice piece for Harvard where he's basically like, I don't know why cyber didn't work against ISIS. You know, it's just, it's kind of ridiculous because the, the target and the capability don't match. And, and that's a challenge. Um, looking at Ukraine, looking at Georgia, we don't find any utility for cyber operations at the tactical level. And that's a key challenge because the course of implementation of cyber and strategy is kind of based on this mythical version of Cyber Pearl Harbor when cyber is a bit more mundane. I think the more interesting analysis I've seen is things like of, um, like say, uh, recent exercises and campaigns where uh, the, the EU, I mean, NATO basically gave two women four SIM cards and two laptops and said, do your worst. And they had people making Facebook groups and giving away their identity and going on Tinder and going on dates. and. You know, I think the, the vulnerabilities in cyber are a lot more mundane and a lot more simple than we realize. And that this idea of a cyber being an exquisite tactical level um, operational art is not going to pan out. It doesn't work that way. And one of the prime reasons is because we don't know how to evaluate effectiveness. But the other thing is that we don't know how to evaluate trade-offs. So, you know, cyber vulnerabilities, malware, zero days, as we call them, are very limited. There's very few of them. So are you going to waste a zero day on some, you know, small little artillery, you know, squad, you know, trying to hack into their systems? Like it's, 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 it's useless. It doesn't meet the cost and the bang for the buck analysis. So there's a lot wrong. And the reason why everything is wrong is because, I mean, I'm sorry, but frankly, um, the U.S. military gets their vision of cyber strategy from, uh, from a ghost fleet. I mean, that's, that's utterly ridiculous. It's, it's sickening. I'm tired of going into general's offices and, them showing me a, a book, Ghost Fleet, and like, this is how cyber works. And I'm just, you know, I, I don't know anymore. And, you know, it's, it's <laughs> or movies, or, or movies, right? Yeah. Uh, I, got a, I got a little anecdote for you on, mod, on war gaming. And so, so I do a lot of war gaming of counterterrorism. Uh, so it's really, it's really a tabletop war gaming. But the way I model cyber is I have an expert, a genuine expert on, on cyber capabilities. So you, so you can imagine what agencies um, that sort of person comes from. And so, so one side says, well, we want to do this. We want to launch this cyber attack. So I go to that person. I say, can they do that? And he'll say, uh, well, they can do this. And so I'll, I'll just let, let that happen. And the other side will respond and, and they'll go to the expert. Can they do that? <laughs> you know, that's, that's how you model it. Uh, that's, that's the best way I've come up with, with modeling cyber in war games. But, um, so listen, I've got, uh, I've got uh, one really really difficult question for you and if you don't like this question we'll just cut it and then you can think about what question you still think i should be asking so what area of the world are you most concerned about uh with future for a future ground war and i suppose there's two ways of cutting that question is uh what is the likeliest place where the united states will be involved in a ground war or Another way of cutting it is what is the riskiest place? So it may not be the likeliest place, but you know, we, we might be more worried about it. That's why I phrased it that way. So what, what is the most worrisome, worrisome area of the world for a ground war involving the United States? Rafi? 
So most likely, I would say still the Middle East, um, partly because no matter how many times people have tried to say that we're going to get out of it, we certainly haven't. Um, and I don't see that happening, at least in the next decade or so. Yeah. I could be proven wrong, but we've, we've seen this show again and again. You know, maybe we're in a little different world with COVID. Uh, the most dangerous, um, in general, the most dangerous conflict would be with China. Uh, you know, it's, as the mil as the resources, economic and and increasingly military, to pose the challenge. Now the problem with that is you know my only caveat to this is the grand you asked about grand warfare in particular. Conflicts we see playing out with China would be mostly air power and maritime heavy. Um, you know there'd be a role for Marines, there'd be a role for some limited army assets it's not going to be the same major force flow that you would get for a contingency in Russia, um, just given the geography of the Indo-Pacific versus Europe. So if you ask general, most dangerous conflict in general, China, most uh, conflict for ground forces, probably Russia and Europe somewhere. Um, and then the most likely one will be doing counterterrorism in the Middle East because we've been doing it for a while and we're going to still do it because they're still Running around. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think Taiwan is the most dangerous future battle point, but that wouldn't be a ground warfare conflict. Um, I hope we move away from the wars in the Middle East. I hope that, you know, fool me once, fool me twice, fool me three times, maybe four times, maybe five times. I, I hope we stop. Um, I, but I'll, I also, I would say we've been doing it for so long. I don't think it's the most difficult. I think really the most difficult is Africa. And, you know, I don't even like calling Africa a region because it's so vast. But, you know, you look at a special operations team that, you know, got beaten up and failed in Niger. Um, that tells you a lot about local support and our problems with these long range operations that we can't support logistically or even, you know, based on, you know, just basic, you know, uh, I don't know what you call it, but, you know, health and support. Um, you know, and also, um, I remember back in the day, I, I didn't like Joe Biden a long time ago because he wanted to send troops to Sudan to pacify Sudan. And, you know, my comment at the time was Sudan is as big as the United States, basically. It's like 75% of the United States and the mainland. And like, we have this view that we can send a thousand troops like we did. And, you know, that didn't even work in the Middle East and it's going to work even less in Africa. So I'm curious how that'll develop going into the future. Um, I think I'm most ho hopeful for Latin America. I think Latin America has been fairly stabilized and, you know, the kind of end of the drug wars and, you know, we see other challenges in Brazil, but I, I'm glad that we're moving away from an idea of combat there. I hope, I don't know. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I, I actually should follow up because I kept saying we should talk about the Arctic. So none of you have mentioned the Arctic um, is it is it of concern? Right. So uh, just to give some uh, parameters to why it is being discussed. So Russia is expanding its uh, permanent basing into the Arctic Circle. Um, obviously, Russia is uh, is also uh, expanding. I don't know if that's the right word, but expanding its uh, naval and also aerial exploration of um, territorial spaces around Norway and even at Britain. In fact, they've, they've flown around France, for instance. So uh, incursions into Sweden that were well reported. So um, there is this concern. So NATO certainly has a concern with its northern flank, as it calls it. So it's left, it's Arctic. Um, in increased risk of uh, operations in within the Arctic Circle, which have peculiar, peculiar requirements. So now you need peculiar capabilities for that which actually traditionally the Marine Corps have played a significant role in. Um, are you concerned about the Arctic? Uh, I, I would say yes. I, I did include it in a book I wrote on Russia. Um, and uh, we are totally unprepared of it. I, I, I had no idea the Marine Corps actually took the lead on this issue before. And I've been working with them for three years. So um, I've never heard of the Arctic really actually mentioned. And um, we are utterly unprepared. Uh, we don't have enough icebreakers. We, we have nothing. And uh, this is where our failure to support our allies is really gonna come to bite us because we need Canada. We need Norway here. And um, they're better positioned uh, both materially and in terms of uh, human capabilities to deal with these issues. And um, we have fallen on our face here. And 
it's a combat zone I haven't even considered since I wrote that book. And it just goes to show the cycle of academia just keeps turning where, you know, one thing's a problem and then it's just not all of a sudden. And we like to forget and ignore things. But yeah, that, that's a big concern given the oil spill uh, with Russia right now that, um, yeah, we, we should be paying more attention to it. Rafi? Yeah, so I would I would echo all of that. Um, the, again, I would just pose the question of should we be concerned about the Arctic or should we be concerned about the Arctic ground warfare? Um, and I think the we should definitely be concerned about the Arctic in general as a region. Uh, as Bandy mentioned, we have we have a grand total of two icebreakers, both of them are quite old. Uh, they're the Coast Guard platform, so and so I worry about Coast Guard. I worry about our relationships with Canada and our other allies for a host of reasons, which is this conversation. I worry about the Arctic in terms of the long-range bomber flights um, by the Russians primarily. Um, I worry about Russians running around in the Arctic Circle. But all of that is not necessarily a driver of ground presence. I mean, I guess you could have some air defense presence there. Or, um, we can talk about sort of uh, missile defense of the Arctic is actually a pretty good place to base it. But by and large, those usually aren't going to be U.S. Army folks. Um, the Marines have had a long-standing relationship with Norwegians. That's, that's different. Um, so, you know, we talk about the Russian incursion into the high north of Norway. I can make that. But in terms of, like, actual, like, large-scale ground combat in the Arctic Circle, I still find that somewhat less plausible. Um, so I see, I see us being worried about the Arctic, but I see ground forces playing a more of a supporting role than necessarily being in the lead. Well, great. Um, so this is your opportunity for you to ask a question that you want to answer um, or, or add any final thoughts that have not been expressed yet. I, I would just say, I think we need to be more concerned with how we develop doctrine and strategy. And there are a lot of great lessons from the rise of the aircraft carrier and the rise of air power and how we integrated uh, these capabilities and knowledge of these capabilities into the military. And we're doing this exactly backwards with AI and cyber and other new technologies. So I think we've kind of forgotten our future, our, our past in terms of innovation. And to me, that's really troubling. Um, you know, we have a vision of say cyber for all to teach uh, professional military education uh, to teach our leaders. Uh, but I could tell you, you know, I've written three books on cyber. I serve at a national level commission. I still don't know what cyber for all means and I don't know how we're going to communicate that to our troops really. So that, that's a challenge. So I would, I would echo that and I would even go one step further is that we don't spend enough time thinking about capabilities, capabilities in general forget about new ones, you know, I'll go back to all, we've talked about long-range fires, for instance. I mean, the, and you hear the army saying, well, that's our solution to the end of the Pacific. It's like, how exactly are you going to use these things? Like, and to what end? You're just going to turn bombardment fight? I mean, what, what exactly are you going to hope to accomplish with these capabilities once you have that? And that's, that's what exactly is our theory of victory? And that is no ways as clear-cut as I would like it to be. Well, well said to you. Th thank you both. Uh, very articulate and uh, very stimulating. I actually learned a lot from both of you, and I very much appreciate that. So I'm going to thank you both for your military service. I'm going to thank you for your public service in writing the reports you've, you've already uh, published in the public domain about the future of warfare. And I'm going to thank you for your public service in speaking to me, my students, and uh, the wider public. So thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Rafi. I hope we have the opportunity to meet in the real world post post emergency. <laughs> so thank you both. I'll sign off and say goodbye. Thanks, Bruce. Bye bye. Thank you.